This is the reality show on Calabash TV, our very first show since Carnival 2017 in St. Lucia. It's all very quiet now. Um, it was pretty uh, loud last Monday and Tuesday, and now we've gotten back to almost like immediately after jazz. Everything goes very quiet. I'm happy to welcome in studio with us two gentlemen who have followed uh, this year's Carnival very closely, and I'm sure for many years as well. We'd like to, uh, to, to invite to our studios here uh, Adrian Oje, who's immediately to my left. Who uh, Congratulations, first of all, Adrian, on this year's achievements as well. And Norbert Williams, who's here from the UK, who's covered a lot of events in St. Lucia, and you're here personally to cover a few events, including Carnival. I think, I think we did meet uh, when the uh, French swimmer was trying to go around St. Lucia, so we're also here for that as well. That's right. And actually, that's the US. That's the US. Across the pond. <laughs> really? Yes. It shouldn't take you that long. And what we want to do on this program today is to look at 2017, the Carnival 2017 in St. Lucia, just to look at it from a slightly different perspective. We have a product, and that's why we have Mr. Williams here. From the U.S., you get a good perspective of what uh, our product is here in St. Lucia, how it's perceived internationally. You also get to compare it directly with other uh, diasporas as well. So we want to find out from you in terms of how you see it over there. So we'll have that discussion in a little bit. And also we have Mr. Adrian Oje, who's been steeped in this uh, thing for quite a long time. Uh, he's pretty well decorated <laughs> in terms of achievements in the creative part of it as well, also the administrative part of Carnival. So Adrian, welcome to Calabash and also to Thank the reality you. show. Thank you. First of all, like I said, congratulations. Um, it was a pretty awesome costume that came out on the night of King and Queen of the Bands. And we were just discussing before we went on air that finally we got space, real estate, mm -hmm. for you to play, a pretty good play playground. Talk to us about, we'll get to number in just a little bit. For you walking onto that stage, and we know that we've heard that things are going to be changing for Carnival and, and, and for the festivals in St. Lucia as well. What is it like wheeling up onto that massive stage? Um, okay, so I guess the history of it is that um, for many years I went to Mendo Phillip Park every year and I spoke to a bull cauldron and begged him to make sure the ramp was long enough and wide enough and not too steep and um, smooth enough so that everyone, including mm -hmm. myself or my, my, um, my candidates for king or queen, could, could get safely up. Um, I've st sort of stopped doing that for a few years and accepted that what will be will be. <laughs> and um, inevitably there have been wires or speakers or some impediment to the proper, um, the proper access for costumes. But um, this year, I must say, it's, it was eventually um, uh, much better. The ramp was a nice, long, wide ramp. It was great. Um, there was a wire running across it which would have impeded some of the taller costumes but fortunately that was moved and I was very impressed that the organizers were able to move it in reasonable time. In fact, they took a recess um, and assured us that the wire would be moved so that our kings and queens, which were quite tall, um, would not be impeded. And the fact that they did it, the fact that they noticed, agreed and did something about it was was a marked difference and much appreciated. Then, um, well, I know for myself, when I got on the stage, I thought to myself, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, normally, you know, you do two turns and you're lashing the bandman or the MC or somebody in the head with, you know, the extension of the costume. Uh, but this was wonderful. There was lots of space. I only hope and pray that it's going to be the same again because we have a way where we get it right mm -hmm. one year <laughs> and then we deliberately undo it the next. So I want to make a special appeal. Uh, please have the same size stage. And we forgive you the fact that the ramp was still being constructed at 7.30 when I got there <laughs> because it was worth waiting for. Let's acknowledge that and let's say hats off to um, the officials from the St. Lucia Events Company for giving us, in my view, the best stage that we've had for a long while. 
I also want to say that the, the on-stage screens were amazing. Um, they allowed the audience to appreciate the detail of the costume. And uh, again, speaking for my part, I know that when I saw the Queen costume on the screen as well as on the stage, it was very impressive. I, I was glad to know that um, viewers at home were able to appreciate the detail. Um, and certainly when I went on and I looked back and I thought, well, this isn't too bad at all. I said, you know, finally kings and queens are getting, you know, something, some recognition, some decent infrastructure to work with. Uh, the lighting uh, appeared to be okay. I did not assess it um, in great detail, but the lighting appeared to be quite nice. And there were some moving heads which made a difference to the general quality of presentation. So, all in all, I would say hmm, maybe 8.5 <laughs> out of 10. Oh, cool, that's pretty good. Um, yeah, pretty yeah, good. 8.5 out of 10 for, for staging. Mm -hmm. um, we would still like to get to the point where we have a toilet backstage. Um, some of us have to go by the white van parked against the wall, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> and um, uh, it would be nice also to have some tenting um, that that is really big enough to accommodate um, costumes. Um, that shower came down on Thursday night and pretty much everybody got wet. Yeah. So uh, we know it's not easy because the costumes are large, but it would be nice if we made some attempt to get some cover. Should be very are, I mean, difficult for us yeah. because we used to the standards of jazz, yes. and I think nobody we had that discussion earlier. Um, when you came in and you understood that we were going to be go to the Sab instead of the mm -hmm. usual either um, Bosage or Marsha or, or, or from Pigeon Island, um, and you walked in there, what was your initial reaction? Well, pleasantly surprised. It um, was large enough, apparently. Um, nobody seemed to have any problems with the, the size of, of uh, the VG playing field, the Sab. Um, there was a lot of anticipation, including from myself, of uh, the problems that we've had over the years with mud, mm -hmm. and pleasantly surprised that there wasn't any such problem at all. Maybe in the backstage area where the heavy equipment was moving up and down quite a bit, there was some mud, but in the general audience area, the sand, the sab, held up pretty well, and, and uh, I don't think there was any problems with that at all. Um, this, there seemed to have been a lot more maneuverability, if you will, with the crowd. They, you had the tents um, closer to the airport side of the field with uh, the drinks and the eats and the stage area on the other side. And people moved around freely. There was a lot of space. People socialized. You could get close to the stage if you wanted to at any time. You could go back. And th there wasn't this uh, packing of people that we have associated a lot with with other locations for whatever reason. So I, I was very pleased with that. There, there was no constraints with moving around and seeing everywhere you went within the location, you had a view of the stage. And I think that was uh, uh, very advantageous to people who usually complain about not being able to see properly. and. I, I think it went down very well. And we'll focus a little bit on the export um, aspect of it. We know just by having the show itself, having it beamed across the world on the internet, on, on, on cable, that it's already global. So it's been exposed already, but we'll talk a little bit about um, you know, the actual content and so on. What we'll do since Adrian mentioned it, and we started with Adrian because of... It. Actually, Adrian, can you believe it was my first time at a King and Queen of the Bands show ever? I don't know. <laughs> so I wanted to go there this time to, to see it, and I actually enjoyed it. It was fun, yeah. and I think I heard the MC say that it was of a very high standard this year as well. I want to start with uh, showing, just clip some highlights from the Queens, first of all, mm -hmm. and then we'll get to you and the Kings in just a little bit. So let's get to the Queen of the Band contestants. Ladies and gentlemen, from the big band Royal Lights Extreme, this is Natalie Dujon, Sky on Fire.
now showcases the reflection of the vulture and all the expressions of the indelible mark of war and degradation on faces embroidered into the tied wings as it unfolds just like those of the vulture her wings luminous wings now ripped by the wind outstretched as she glides not gracefully but steadily staggering across the midnight skies So there we have it, the Queens on the night, Adrian, I enjoyed it tremendously and um, some good talent in there. I, I want to speak with you about the designing, I saw quite a bit of work into some of those costumes, that must be extremely tedious, uh, but it's fun I guess. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a labor of love, um, certainly for the Tribe of Twelve, there are four of us who take charge mm -hmm. and um, by taking charge I mean financial charge, we raise the money and create the, the large costumes for our band. So that means by February we're in Trinidad um, buying materials, laying out hard cash. Um, uh, by that time we've already designed, certainly conceptually we know what we're doing, detail to be enhanced as we go along. So we get our preliminary materials at that time. So from February we're putting out um, resources. And then um, the actual active process will take eight weeks mm -hmm. normally f as soon as jazz is finished in mm -hmm. may um we secure a warehouse somewhere again that's another outlay of cash and um we would start the active building 
at least six weeks, minimum six weeks before carnival. Mm -hmm. And in that case, then we're working pretty much every night until well after midnight. If if you go home at two, you consider it an early night. So it's a it's a lot of man hours. The design process specifically, um, it's it's iterative. You know, it's back and forth. You start off at least in our case, we start off with broad concepts, which tie in with the theme of the band, and then we develop them as we go along. Um, Certainly in, in, in my own experience, I find that the long gestation period, although it's more demanding, it's very critical to fleshing out the design and having the time to add detail. And as you add the detail, you, 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 um, you deepen the portrayal mm -hmm. and you, you get to know the costume. So the costume starts to tell its own story, so to speak and um, it develops a personality. So by the time you're playing the costume, it has, um, it has developed its story and, and you have time to figure out how the pieces fit together conceptually and uh, artistically, creatively. So um, the, the, the commentary, for example, for, um, for my costume, for Poseidon, could not have been written um, in isolation. It would have to be written sitting there, looking at the costume and seeing where it's going and being able to tell the story and then adding whatever detail is necessary to make sure that the story is complete. So the, the four pillars of Atlantis, for example, were part of the portrait from very early. But when we added in the sirens between the four pillars, then the story took on another dimension. And um, those were done fairly early, so you'll start to get, you know, you start to get into the portrait. Mm -hmm. No, but um, <coughs> because we are having a discussion in the context of the export, some of these costumes, and I've always said that, you know, you admire them on the day and the Tuesday, Wednesday after, you, know, you have no idea what's happening to them, and some of them should have at least a year's existence. Um, for example, like a Macy's Day Parade and so on, what happens to those? Do they store those things somewhere? What, what, what could we be doing with those costumes? To well, well, if you're looking at exporting them to maybe New York... Not so much sending them overseas, but putting them somewhere where people can come to watch them, view them, like well, an exhibition. Well, well, well that's, a, that's a good idea, mm -hmm. but then that comes, what comes into play or question is the storage. Who's going to take up the responsibility for that? Who's going to be responsible for the maintenance of that? And during what time of the year, what period, what event mm -hmm. are you going to use these costumes for? Um, I think what we need to do is to look at the viability of using these with uh, or, or within the context of Soleil or anything else that we have, um, whether it's during uh, Food and Rum or whether it's uh, Jeune Coyol or whether it's any of the other festivals during the year, that we can showcase what Carnival is and by extension I would suppose that would apply to the other events as well. We could have cross marketing, if if you will, that we can use the entire Soleil Summer Festival as marketing for everything else, mm -hmm. and and that would keep up uh, not just uh, an awareness of what we've been able to do throughout the year, but create some sort of anticipation of what we're going to do next year to to better what we, we what we've had this year. So, for example, Ian, can a hotel adopt a costume? Eat at least which one? Take one. Um, I think it's a it's a wonderful idea, but I don't think it works in practical terms. Mm. Um, what would be what would be great? I mean, and, and I'm sort of reacting to the, the suggestion that I've gone just a while ago. Um, first of all, I think we need to get our costumes out there into mainstream carnivals. Mm -hmm. If we're promoting Sancho Carnival as a global brand, um, in conjunction with Soleil, for example. I think we need to spend some money and get our costumes out into New York, London, Miami. Um, those would be the minimum ones, okay? Great coverage, lots of exposure, Caribana perhaps as well. Um, that's an analysis that can be made based on cost and practicality. Um, they, these things have to travel in container. There's really no other way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but it is useful to know that uh, certainly in our case, we have been sending um, our king and our queen to Guadeloupe um, mm. for Guadeloupe Carnival and Gozier in particular, which is a, one of the, the, the villages with the most extravagant celebration. And uh, it goes to Gozier. Uh, last year they actually came down and saw it at Carnival and I've already had a call or two 
um, which I need to follow up on. <laughs> and um, they actually bought the King costume last mm -hmm. year. They bought it outright. It's a small contribution to the overall cost, but it's at least yeah. one has the satisfaction of not dumping the damn thing. Um, and that is, that is good. So there is certainly potential for these things to appear elsewhere, to be part of the global promotion of this mm -hmm. Zenusha Carnival brand and the Soleil brand as well. Otherwise, we have to find some benefactor who's going to allow us to um, store the costume somewhere. Uh, last year we were fortunate and we must acknowledge um, uh, Mr. Lincoln Centrals who is very, very tolerant and if he has a space he allows mm -hmm. us to leave the costume there and we were able to bring it out for the visit of Prince Harry. Mm -hmm. We had a whole um, cultural parade including uh, costumes um, from our band where we had won so there was some um, justification for that I hope. And, um, we were able to bring it out. So that was filmed by people from all over the world. Has it produced an actual tangible request for um, St. Lucia Carnival product to appear anywhere else? Not yet, but maybe there is some chance that it will. The bottom line is that these things have tremendous value and um, monetary and otherwise. And if we can create circumstances for them to be used, then we should. I was thinking just in the last few evenings, um, whether we cannot do something right here, first of all, there, I believe, is space on the port. Mm -hmm. I think I heard um, the Prime Minister, maybe, I don't want to misquote him, saying that the buildings on the port were empty um, and could be used. I mean, if we could do a kind of a museum right. on the port and port gasseries in the middle of downtown, you could create narratives, you could do from our neighbors. photo ops. <laughs> So you could do narratives, you could do photo ops, you could, you could create a whole kind of an experience uh, for people to relive this and, and, um, and get the publicity globally that, that is possible from that. So I made an offer also um, last night in, on, on public television that I'm, I'm very willing to teach anybody who wants to learn. So anything that we can do to deepen and broaden the impact and the economic value of the festival, I think we should because we're in danger of losing the, the majesty of it, the pageantry yeah, of it. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, every country can produce a thousand pairs of bouncing boobs. Mm -hmm. That's not going to differentiate Senor Chico Carnival from, from um, anything else. Brazil does it better than we do. Trinidad does it better than we do. So the, the, the visual content of our festival, I think, is very, very important. Um, we can talk a little bit about the route when you're ready. I, we have some ideas. Mm -hmm on that as well. Exactly. But, right. but listening yes. to mm -hmm. um, what Adrian just said, um, we have heard over the years, and I, I recall quite a number of years ago, whether correctly or incorrectly, but maybe Adrian could um, attest to that or clarify that. Um, we heard that Carnival was being moved from February to July to get away from the competition mm -hmm. of Trinidad and Brazil Carnival. How we have benefited from that is left to be seen well. Have we really benefited from it? Have we really maximized getting away from the competition of Brazil Absolutely. And, and Trinidad? And how are we incorporating Carnival into the product which is St. Lucia Tourism? Because coming down here a few weeks ago, um, there was a question asked by the flight attendant how many people are coming down to St. Lucia or going down to St. Lucia to get married or to attend the wedding and almost the entire plane put up their hands, everyone. Um, and as in not carnival. Not carnival. That's right. Okay. To get married. Mm -hmm. So how do we piggyback Maybe you're on, on the wrong flight. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you want the Friday flight. <laughs> I was there a few weeks before carnival. Oh, you too but, early. But, but, so. but what I'm saying is how do we piggyback on St. Lucia's popularity with, as a tourism destination and as a honeymoon or a wedding destination? How do we incorporate carnival into that? You know, how do we get our carnival product into the wedding magazines mm -hmm. and advertising and all of that outside? That, that's something we have to look at piggybacking and using the strengths of different opportunities that we have to maximize the benefit that we can get from tourism and carnival. Okay. I think that may be two different markets. Huh? Yes, yes, I was about to say that as well, but, but we'll certainly have a Not that they can't be merged, but I think yeah. as they exist now, they're two different markets. Right. All right, you want to get to the king and king of the bands, um, the one that Adrian is involved in, so let's feature a little bit of that can first I of all. Can I just say that, yes. that we also need to um, think a little bit outside of the costume element mm -hmm. of, the, of the festival, 
because the music certainly travels. Yeah. Um, and it is the easiest thing to travel, and it does quite well. Mm -hmm. And related, without delaying you, but related mm -hmm. to the comment a little while ago about the change of the time and the getting away from the competition, what we were able to do as a summer festival is to create an environment for much a much higher level of integration and collaboration between islands. So your pan men now go to Trinidad, and pan men come from Trinidad and, and work here. Um, our musicians, uh, particularly our producers and writers, are doing a lot of work with Trinidad because you're not focusing on your own season at the time. Costume makers, there's been a lot of exchange between Trinidad and St. Lucia on that level as well. So we've been able to come out of the shadow of the Trinidad Carnival. And, and for something as simple as not competing for materials at the same time, uh, that has also been an important component of it. What we've not done, though, is to have a strategic plan for the development of the carnival, at least not one that we have implemented. But there was a national symposium, Bernard, you might recall. Mm -hmm. I think it was um, um, Ember Charles was, the, was the, one of the main facilitators mm -hmm. at the time, the national consultation on carnival. Unfortunately, that was followed by a regime who discarded every recommendation that was made. Um, but we can go back to that because the, 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 the sector knows what it would like to see happen and it has been documented. The carnival community has its head on. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's not always the case with the government of the day. Okay. We will go on to the uh, king of the bands to see what the offering was for 2017. My mother rushing us out of the house. Everyone running to the water's edge of the Conway Basin. The sky red and bellowing with fire. People crying, our homes burning. Then one old lady said, look in the sky, the devil come for us. After the hot God speller has leveled all but the church in sky, I wrote the tale by tallow of a city's death by fire. Under a candle's eye that smoked in tears, I wanted to tell in more than wax of faiths that will snap like wire. Ladies and gentlemen, from Big Band Royal Ice Extreme, Thomas Saul Sack presents The Two Faces of Midnight. The sun sets on another day, and the evening quickly comes alive. It is the time to go out and celebrate and take in a romantic starry night. But this is also a time of the coming of all the dark forces. This is that the constant struggle between the forces of good and the evil, a delicate balancing act, is followed by tears of joy and champagne being popped. To the left of dark side, the witching hour, it said it's a time when the forces of evil is at its strongest. A time for stealing souls. This is portrayed by a demonic figure with snakes coming out of his head. The snake, the symbol of evil, the temptation of Eve by Satan. The sound of bats, dragons, and cries are now heard, and any living human or animals found are sucked of their blood from their bodies. The master of those demons comes in the form of a giant bat, with a small skeletal body but very large wings, which spreads across the land, with his two soldiers' dragons on either side of him, and two small bats which act like extra eyes for him. The two smaller bats are sent in search of any living humans or animals whilst the dragons are used to drive them into the path of the giant bat who captures them and sucks his victims dry of their blood and 
stores the excess blood in large tubing, leading to a large storage compartment that could be used for another demon and night creature. There are two lost souls who have been drained off of their blood by the demon and are made of foam with cloth that expresses the pain they went through. The giant bat is made of steel and his wing is covered with net. The two small bats and dragons are made of foam with body of the dragon and the storage is made from ace events. And to the back you can see the sun setting. Directly above the head of the rebel is the eye of the horse. A top of panel representing the all-seen eye and the power of the spirit. Meldon X, the carnival band from Freeport presents Barry Hunt in the costume, Glory of Egypt. Costume designed by Barry Hunt. Band leader Barry Hunt and built by the Meldon X, the carnival band. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you king of the band. sons and daughters of that land that gave them birth rebel. They complained that the hours were too short in February and the March weather far too hot. The sun in late July they preferred and together appointed a new date for carnival to be held. Had they forgotten the amnesty? Without a Lenten season there would be no Easter. What kind of Ash Wednesday would they wait to see? Morning came fast and they arrived at last. But what should have been a beautiful morning was now conceived by dark clouds that came without any warning. The angel of darkness opened his gates, welcoming the carnival reprobates. Dynasty presents a hell of a mass for its portrayal 2017. The incomparable Cedric Laura at the helm as the Midnight Reaper, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, seeking the souls of those whom he may devour. Molten ash, brimstone, coal, and fire will be their fate on carnival returns to its original date. Black mesh, glitter braid, and luminous coils. Feathers and plumes are all used effectively to create this imaginative costume designed and created by the ingenious Scene Grease and the Mass Master's Mask. A costume entitled One Hell of a Mass. This costume was sponsored by Johnson's Power Limited, SMG Beverages, Dream Weddings and Tours, Barefoot Holidays, Heineken Brewery, and Tons Plus. and soldier masks were once standard features of many Caribbean carnivals, including St. Lucia's, where the Cozy Guzzlers band kept up the tradition for many years. Sailor mask is associated with the U.S. military presence in the region during the Second World War. The main feature of this costume is an oversized collar magnified for maximum effect. It is reminiscent of a giant wave towering over the masquerader's head. The entire costume reflects colors of sea and sky, reinforcing its nautical scene. In the tradition of choosing a single dominant motif, a royal blue symbol of a flying fish dominates the central panel. Decorative lines represent scales. The collar is framed with wrapped foam rope, signifying waves of light dancing on water. True to form, the masquerader himself is garbed in an ornate sailor suit, complete with captain's hat, epaulets, bell bottoms, and a wide collar. His suit is adorned in the traditional sailor style with appliques, mirrors, and contrasting swans down. White gloves and applicate shoes complete his attire. Poseidon passes through the four pillars of Atlantis. Penance affixed to these pillars honor the four spirits of the deep. Enchantment, enticement, deception, and death. He is surrounded by an arsenal of gold trident spears, his favorite weapon of war and the symbol of his legendary power. As he emerges from the waves, his 
His battle armor resembles torrents of water falling off his glistening body. To his left and right are the hulls of ships sinking beneath the waves. Behind him, water vines bathed in blue light tower toward the surface. Siren mermaids lurk between the east and western pillars. Their eerie voices and promises of treasure lure seamen to their watery deaths. Between the two southern pillars, the awesome face of Poseidon breaks the surface of the sea, witness to the demise of yet another unfortunate voyager. This is Poseidon, known to Romans as Neptune, god of water, ocean, and sea. This is Poseidon, lord of the deep. That is the kind of costume that the world ought to see. Adrian, also the one from Luigi as well. <laughs> and everybody else who was in the event diary as well. They were some pretty um, amazing costumes and I was making a point that it can't be over on the night um, of King and Queen and probably on the road as well. We basically sit for a short while on the road. Yes. It has to, to me it has to have at least another year of existence. Another year of existence before it disappears. But as it is now, Adrian, yours is stored somewhere. Yes, it's safely. It's in our it's in our warehouse, it's and warehouse. Um, it's available for public performance if somebody would want it. But mm -hmm. um, Bernard, I think that we need to acknowledge that, unfortunately, we live in a society where we do a lot of one-off stuff. Um, it's just like a play that appears once at the cultural center, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, if you're lucky, and then it's gone. You never see it again. And we need to be transforming our society into a place where um, creative talent, art. Um, and things of beauty are valued and, and, and we seek to preserve them and have them as part of our lives. Um, I'm very disappointed to say that the last time I offered to put a King of the Band costume in Huanora Airport, I was roundly um, scolded for, <laughs> for thinking that my costume should have such a privilege. And I was asked, why is it, why is it my costume should be on display? Never mind, it had won the competition mm. and we were making an offer for art in public places. So. We need to inculcate these values um, in, in, in our society, in our, in our thinking and our feeling that, that things of beauty should be part of our lives and, and not just um, 6.30 and bad in bum bum and, and other aspects which you know, are somewhat questionable as to their value. Yeah, there was one person who really appreciated your, your, the costume, in fact the portrayal this year, your portrayal, and I was having a chat with him, I met him on the road on, on, on Monday, or Tuesday it was, as a uh, radio personality, Sam Jugwa Flood, and I got a comment from him, <laughs> he was able to connect with uh, what you were offering for, for 2017. The fact that there was a band with the Matlow section, and they were dressed like the Jackabats of old days. It reminded me of my little boyhood days growing up in Vieco. And as far as I'm concerned, that band should be Band of the Year. We're talking about the Guadeloupians now. The Guadeloupians now, they are French. And they now are dressing like St. Lucians in Carnival. No, 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 no. They always are well dressed. All right, but this year they came out like St. Lucian. Okay. So it was indeed a, a good, a good observation from Sam Jugwafla. He did say that it was a little more St. Lucian than the typical Guadeloupians. 
Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that clip. Um, Sampler doesn't always agree with me, so well, no, that's I, one I of take it as, as, as a great honor that he should be so candid yes. in his support. So we, we, we like that. But feedback is good, you know. Yes, I mean, we have to learn to live with, with mm -hmm. criticism, and and um, an endorsement when it comes is very welcome. Yeah. Um, it's, go ahead. Yeah, I was about to say this is the reality show. We'll take a break and come back. There's a lot of ground we have to cover right here, so we'll be back in just a few moments. This is happening. This is our reality. This is Calabash TV. Saul St. Lucia urges you to pay attention to safety tips about your cooking gas cylinder. In particular, to inspect regularly for a faulty hose or regulator. How prepared are you? Answer this simple question and you could win a Sol gas voucher for a filled 20 pound cylinder. Question number one. In the event of a cooking gas leak, what must you do? A. Run. B. Open all windows and doors. C. Put on a switch. Text your answers to 285-2892 for a chance to win a 20 pound Sol gas voucher. With just one click, the internet connects people, businesses, and nations. Being connected can open a world of information and opportunities. You can get services and products of your choice much faster. From electronic financial transactions to connecting with family and friends. From being up to date with the latest news and information to learning new skills and acquiring academic qualifications. All from the convenience of your home or wherever you roam. Get connected today. This message is brought to you as a public service announcement by Ectel, the NTRC, and this station. This summer, get ready, set for school with the Educator or Educator Plus loan from the St. Lucia Civil Service Cooperative Credit Union. No more back-to-school stress. The Educator loans will take care of everything you need, including school fees, materials, and supplies. Up to $10,000 for primary and secondary students and up to $15,000 for young adults with affordable payments for up to two years. Call or visit us for more information today. The Educator and Educator Plus loan only at the St. Lucia Civil Service Cooperative Credit Union. Save and borrow with pride. Terms and conditions apply. This is the reality show on Calabash TV and in the studio with us we have Adrian Oje who's well known in cannibal circles and also the creative industries in Slovakia plus other areas as well, business and also now a senator as well. And uh, Norbert who is uh, here with us, Norbert Williams who is in the US, connected to Lucia in a big way. You have uh, a Facebook page as well that you Carry. Right. Sometimes I get news from here, from you, from the well, US. Well, that's good. <laughs> and keep looking. And uh, One Lucia News as well, which is the website with uh, strictly devoted to St. Lucia News. Right. And so you hear this time for Canada and for a few other things that you, you're covering here as well, as part of that, and also your interest as a St. Lucia. And we were just talking about um, exporting and so on. And one of the, and Adrian mentioned it in his conversation earlier, about it's very easy for the music to get exported. It's already happening. We do have some artists who are already, as soon as Carnival is over, they travel. And I mean, Tillerson was traveling quite a bit last year, and Ricky mm -hmm. T as well. So they're quite busy flying the Senusha flag and also promoting the Senusha product. We'll talk a little bit about some of the new products coming on the street, on, on stream as well. But the obviously the big show, um, Adrian, I'm sure you'll agree, the road march happened towards the end in terms of the, the, the songs for the road. Mm -hmm. But the discussion, the bulk of it was on the um, Calypsos. I don't know if that was your sense even before you came down, but if you were getting the feel, you were getting the vibes about Calypso 2017 in Senusha. Well, well, to be quite honest with you, um, Calypso 2017 did not and has not really resonated with me i guess maybe i was distracted by other things but um unlike other years there seemed to be some lack of publicity outside unless you're particularly looking mm -hmm. for the calypso music other, other years it seemed to be a little bit more pervasive 
Um, this year it just eluded me for some reason. Um, St. Lucians, as usual, are into their Calypso, and I must say there have been a few controversial songs about issues as Calypso has continued to be over the years. Um, one of the things, along with the Calypso and the music associated with this year's carnival, is what a number of people would consider to be a derogatory aspect of things. Um, Badin Bum Bum comes to mind. Um, I don't know whether it was intentional or whether just inadvertently, but what seems to have eluded most persons with that song is it's actually an encouragement for education, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. And most people seem to have missed that message and concentrated on or focused on the badin bum bum and the, the, the dancing side of things. and. Um, Surprisingly, it uh, puts a lot of pressure on the women in our society who don't have anything else much more to offer other than being bad in bum bum. Let, let's be realistic. And ironically, the people who were more focused on that song were the women during the carnival. So it's, it's something to consider um what's really coming out of that and the question now with our music making strides ricky t tedison john and and others where is the market for this is this marketable outside of saint lucia our little patois phrases and and our little colloquial expressions are they marketable outside of saint lucia and are our artists limiting their scope with concentrating or sticking just to that. If we look at Marshall Montano, he's definitely crossed over quite some time now. His music is being played in clubs in Japan, in Germany, in Europe. And we have to ask ourselves, what has he done to get into those markets? Has he stuck with a Trinidad-centric style and focus of music? Or has he incorporated the violin? Has he incorporated different styles of music? Even now, there's soca in Japan. You know, so what are, what are our artists doing to get themselves out of the constraints or the confines of the St. Lucia, St. Lucia marketplace? We hear a lot about economies of scale. Yes, an artist can eke out a living performing, doing little gigs at hotels and elsewhere in St. Lucia. But the money, the popularity, the international acclaim is not in St. Lucia. You have to move out. So the Achilles heel to a lot of what happens in St. Lucia is that whatever it is, is always secondary. It's, it's almost like a hobby. Our musicians, our, our sportsmen, whatever they're doing always falls second and third place to other things. You're in a band and you have to practice every night and some guy's child is sick or he has to go pick up his girlfriend or he has to do something else and we're competing not among ourselves but for the international dollar and if we need to do that just like the gymnasts just like the olympians just like the international artists we have to dedicate much more time to what we're doing so that we can become professionals instead of just being a hobby now our our music artists our singers they have to realize that as a business you must have a plan you must have a strategy you must have a target audience and too many of them are just singing for carnival and the rest of the year they're just laying about until a few months before calypso season comes around and they're throwing together a few lines and that's it if this is the attitude or if it's the approach then we're not going to go any further than we have been over the years and it, it, it seems strange that with the access we have through the internet in observing other artists, whether it's Marshall Montano, whether it's Burning Flames and the success that we've, they've had, where is the consistency to compare with those other islands, with the bands that we have in St. Lucia? How long do they last? And why don't they last compared to the others? 
Th right. That's the question we have to ask. Yeah, I think we're covering some pretty good ground um, in terms of the questions that you're asking in terms of the consistency. I mean, we're not, we don't have the kind of scale that Trinidad has and Jamaica has, but in terms of stepping it up, I but think But why, why don't we? Why don't we? Can't, uh, music is not different anywhere else. No, but, the the market is, but the market is small. It's a lot smaller. The market is small, and, um, and, and the surpluses you generate, yeah. the surpluses you can generate in this economy are very small. Um, if you make it in a market of a million people, which is what Trinidad is, and you have a successful show, you're going to have some money left over after you pay the bills. In St. Lucia, a lot of artistic and creative activity, mm -hmm. there is no money left over after you pay the bills. In fact, you're lucky you're if old. you pay the bills. <laughs> you're you're slow. probably owe people. And yeah. it's, it's quite a wonder that, that so many of us mm -hmm. continue to produce excellent work under those circumstances. And so it is, people do not do art as a sideline because they want to do it as a sideline. Most artists would love to do nothing else mm -hmm. for the entire day and night. Um, but it is not possible and nobody is going to give you a mortgage or a car loan based on your income as a costume designer. Just doesn't happen. Yeah. But, but I think so, too, yeah. so, but I think, I think but, too, yeah, go ahead. So just want to finish this. So, mm -hmm. so, so what that points to is a number of things. Number one, the remuneration for artists needs to be better. Mm -hmm. And that speaks directly to the tourism industry. We are not paying our artists enough for them to earn a decent living from the thing that they can do and love to do the most. In the, in the context of the carnival, the incentive structure and the price structure, which we have been trying to get past for at least the last six years, certainly since I was president of the, of the Carnival Bands Association, is ignored, largely ignored every year. And so you have a situation which I mentioned before that first, second and third gets announced. But the price structure goes down to fifth, sixth and seventh. Why is it that the producers of Carnival consistently ignore the rest of the people in the competition? Our parents' fees should be paid. And on top of that, when the government is putting additional millions of dollars into Carnival, why is it going into infrastructure? It's going into management. It's not going into product. And we had an incentive system some time ago which actually happened under um, um, Minister of Tourism, Alan Chastney, where additional money was put in and we managed very efficiently an incentive scheme which provided cash support on a highly accountable basis um, to directly to carnival bands. If you produced a band, you got a little support. If you produced a king or a queen or a junior king or junior queen, you got a little support. Immediately you saw the increase in the output and in the quality of content. We, are, we continue to, to, to manage manifestations. We have a show, the show began, it ended, and we think That's it's right, a success. Yeah. Nobody is investing in the development, content. The development, product development. And this is where we need to go if we want to see anything improve, and if we want to um, incentivize people properly, we have to address those issues. Yeah, I agree with you, uh, no, but in a very quick answer, because we have to play some, some clips as well as we move along. In terms of the product development that I think Adrian mentioned, um, we need to have that institutionalized in a sense, mm -hmm. because I was explaining Actually. to somebody that we have nobody really teaching you music management and so right, on. Right. Even songwriting, as a basic as songwriting, I'm almost sure the School of Music doesn't teach you well, to write let's songs. let's start with English, Bernard. Nobody's well, teaching you English. Well, <laughs> nobody's <laughs> teaching you history, geography, English, or literature. So How we have those issues. How do you expect the songwriting to improve? But in terms of the music getting to Japan, it's very quite likely, because don't forget we enjoyed Gangnam Style and I have no idea what the song was saying. Exactly. So something exactly. like Baden Bama could be playing in a night club in Japan, they don't have to know the words because um, I, I've seen children singing it and they have no idea what some of those words are because the guys have creatively used quail in there. They know the song, the rhythm is good and it's, it is, it's good to dance and so on, it's very danceable, but in terms of um, export, I think that music can go, can travel, but, but how do we capitalize on it? It's traveling it already. Already traveling. It's, already it's traveling. in England, it's, in, it's all over the Caribbean, it's certainly in the US, and because the rhythm, the rhythm is so infectious, and let's face it, it's it has a certain primitive power to yeah, it that yeah. doesn't require a whole lot of sophistication to enjoy. I mean, you get that thing going and, and you go and you yeah, just but, go with but it. But I agree with you, no, but so. in terms of the, if you were to commercialize it and you were to get airplay, obviously there has to be some work done on the lyrics and but, so on. But we were saying, yeah. we were saying mm. recently in our previous conversation mm. about trying to get, since we have a, a, a limited market, an economy of scale that we have to seriously consider, what we need to do is to piggyback as much as possible with our tourism product use for for example um, Jamaica uses Bob Marley music in their tourism mm -hmm. promotions but how did that happen Bob Marley wasn't big overnight we we I'm sure most of us remember his um, um, song um, reggae's on Broadway from the 70s you know that that came that became the point where reggae basically crossed over 
into the mainstream and was on was on Broadway. It was at Times Square in the crossroads of the world. So how do we get our music to cross over from just being music from St. Lucia to being associated, to be as a marketing tool for St. Lucia's product? Well, we need to I develop to... that. We need to develop that real road. Mm -hmm. Mali, reggae, Chris Blackwell, mainstream music, America, Europe. I mean, that was, the, that was the formula. One of our issues is here that we, we don't study the success of our peers, so one of us will make it and there will be no roadmap right. left behind right. for the next person who comes along. And even quite apart from information not being available, we do not create the institutional networks. So it's, you know, Ricky T's success, breaking into the Trinidad market. Teddison and John's um, passage to Soka Monarch in Trinidad. They didn't judge him fairly, but that's another story. How do you document those things? Bernard, you've been doing some of the groundwork and create a roadmap so the next talent coming along can follow the same trap, the same underground railroad, if you want to call it that, to freedom. That's the analogy that I use. Um, we need to document, we need to study, and we need to get the institutions of government behind us because, as I said earlier, there's not enough money in the pockets of the artists themselves to finance the marketing infrastructure, even the travel to get a ticket to go to Caribbean or, or Labor Day. It's a major investment, and it's not there. And we need our officials to, to sit with us and think about these things and, and generate some real resources into the export of this wonderful creative talent we have all over San Lucia. To give you an insight. Yeah, let me, let me move on because yes. we need to move on. I need to feature a little bit of the music. Because we have some, some, some clips to play as well. Um, and I noticed even in the Road March, for example, that three of the songs that made it, Ricky T1, and the, the, the number two, number one, two, and three, two, and four, were all of the Denry, um, the Denry segment mm -hmm. genre, which is quite interesting. So let's start. We'll play a little bit of Subans, who was the Bad in Bam Bam, and then we'll get to the other artists as we move the conversation along. Nella, not now I'm watching you. You see you. You see you. Huh? You, not bad in English. Not bad in Spanish. But you bad in Bam Bam. You bad in Bam Bam. Listen, when all guns take in push, you position, you unleash. Because you bad in Bam Bam. You bad in Bam Bam. Your man say you're not perfect. Friends say makeup not good. But when you get in the mood, everything looking good. You giving them licks, cause your boom bad doing physics. You not bad in mass, what he doing? Jimmy flicks in matrix. You not bad in the fair mood. You ain't on any tune, cause you bad in bam bam. Uh huh, you bad in bam bam. Not looking like one moon, cause your boom bad doing Thai food, cause you bad in bam bam. You bad in bam bam. Listen, make bam bam touch come, let me see. Shake bam bam in 3D. Well, that's Sir uh, he's established himself in Denry and now he's establishing himself nationally. And even I listened to a, a mixtape from Trinidad that these guys are on mixtapes all over the world as well. Mark 11 also made it. He replaced number two. Let's get a little bit of his music and then we'll get to um, uh, Ricky T in just a while. But Mark, Mark 11 as well also uses a little bit of the Denry influence. Every job, instruction time. Mark 11 again. Breathe in. Last year's Road March King, Mark 11, and this year he is at number two with uh, Shrimp, I think it's called, Bend Your Back Like a Shrimp. And Ambi also is back in the fray. He too also used um, the, the dinner. He wasn't uh, so strong last year, but he came back very strong with a song that is actually taking over most parties in Sebastian. Ambi, where you going there? As I saw Lego and buy. Crazy. Where? Good. Just by Miss Aita Dega, huh. sir. Buy one for me, huh? Buy one. Gonna <laughs> run me now. But I suck it already. I suck it already. It's my partner, mother. That's a lean, I slowly. And 
every day you know I go in and buy purple from she. But the woman telling me I'm be before you eat the ice lolly. Please listen to me, I have a little story. Before you suck it, you have to knock it. But before you suck it, you have to knock it. Before you suck it, you have to knock it. Knock what? My lady, if I tell you, eh, swear, madam, I never knock it up, but I suck it already. Yes, I suck it so there you have it, that's uh, Ambi, that's the uh, the guys who've done pretty well in the road march. So they basically captured the road march this year. I mean, Rikiti won it, but they basically have dominated it. And obviously the music is is, 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 is traveling. Adrian, I was trying to get a comment from you, the music is traveling. Um, it's quite a phenomenon. I, I think there's something powerful about the rhythm. Um, uh, it's... I don't want to say it's bass, but it's 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 fairly mm -hmm. um, guttural. Uh, it's it it, it it appeals to the waistline. It's 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 <laughs> very sexual. Yeah, but in most societies, and Adrian, even if you look at the rap as well, there's some music mm -hmm. that's just for the underground mm -hmm. that you don't play. It's not fit for airplane. Some of these songs probably are not fit for airplane, and so that's kind of common in terms of most uh, musical societies, I suppose. Well, if you listen to the lyrics of both songs, there is actually nothing obscene right. about either one of them. They're mm -hmm. very suggestive, yes. but there's nothing obscene about them. And so you will always be dealing with this um, fine line between what is permissible and what is not. Um, the 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 it is it is the accompanying behavior, the fact that it's more objectionable mm -hmm. to me than the actual lyric of the song or the rhythm of the song. Um, and I think that is something that we need to address to our carnival public as to is there a line and where is it drawn as to as to what is considered appropriate public behavior, what is reserved for the bedroom, quote unquote. Um, and not that I am a prude, but I am very worried about what young children consider to be appropriate behavior. The image that sticks with me we were talking about earlier is a mother standing um, on the street looking at the carnival, Kitty's carnival, at which I think there was too much of that sort mm -hmm. of music. Yeah. And she's holding her child's hand, a girl, and she's looking at the carnival, and the daughter at knee level is carrying on with the most lewd behavior, um, which certainly did not look appropriate to me as far as what a child of five or six should be doing on the sidewalk, on the street. Her mother is holding her hand, looking at the mass, and she's totally oblivious of what her daughter is doing. I think that is a statement about where we are in the society. And rather than talk about censorship and what we keep off the radio or on the radio, I think we need to talk about what are our expectations with regard to the behavior of our children in particular. Where do we draw the line? What is acceptable? How do we, how do we enjoy... Um, um, the fruits of our creativity in a responsible way. How do we do that? I think that is what, as a society, we need to address. There have got to be some limits. Um, and while some of that will always be a personal individual decision, the point is that taxpayers' money is supporting um, something which a vast majority of solutions seem to have a problem with. So um, does the government have the right to take um, your taxpayers' money, if you're a right-wing, um, or certainly right of center, um, moral majority, Christian type person, do you have any objection you know, about your tax dollars going to subsidize and reward and incentivize this sort of thing? I think it's a valid question for our society to address. And I mean, for my own part, I saw no reason to go back to the carnival on Tuesday and I actually stayed home. Now that's just a personal judgment, I can't impose it on anybody, but but without the artistry of, of my band and my costume, I really didn't feel there was a place for me in, in the Tuesday Mass, and so I just decided to stay home. No, but a lot, a lot of these guys will be coming to a, a fit near you in New York because a lot of these guys will be traveling um, with the Sinners music, and I'm sure they will be traveling some of those music as well. Um, from even before you, you, I don't know, even making contact now with, with, with mm -hmm. your people in New York, are they getting the music, are they feeling the vibe, are they understanding? Well, well, well definitely the number ones and the twos mm -hmm. and the road marches from, from St. Lucia definitely makes it up to New York for Labor Day and to Boston and Toronto, Caribbean and everywhere else, Miami for sure. Um, what we need to, to do is to move beyond our communities because again we're talking about economies of scale here and 
when Ricky T or anybody else from St. Lucia comes up to New York for Labor Day, by and large, they're coming to entertain a St. Lucian audience. And that again limits them as far as what they can do financially with that limited audience. Um, what we need to do is use that opportunity to make those contacts, to move beyond the St. Lucian or the diaspora communities because I, I have great difficulty seeing Ricky T or anybody else performing for a Greek audience in New York or for an Italian or Russian audience. But the question remains, why not? Because the music from all of these other countries make it down here. So we need to see what needs to be done with our music to break them in, just like Marshall Montano. What did he do? What have the other regional artists done that make them desirous in those other places? Marshall Montano has broken further and a few years ago played at Madison Square Garden. Can Ricky T do that? Can Teddison John do that? Of course they can, but what roadmap do they have to use to get to that point? That's the important thing. All right, let's get Ricky T. As you mentioned, Ricky T, he won the, the, the road march. In fact, he won two crowns this year, the Power Soccer and also the road march. And Ricky T actually has probably won more crowns than anybody else. In so if you look at what he's done in terms of the body of work that he has, he has won quite a number of crowns and he keeps winning like two every year. So this year he's won two crowns as well. So let's get a little bit of Sully. That is the song that he won that won the road for him and also he didn't win power because he, he sang Sully in the groovy. Um, the power one we didn't know too well. It was a very new song. But there is Ricky T with his Sully video. So there you have it, Ricky T, who was the power soaker king and also the road march king. Ricky T was in that video, I didn't notice him. Uh, no, we don't. <laughs> Nobody saw Ricky T. <laughs> <laughs> he was almost invisible <laughs> in that video. That's Ricky T and Sully, and I know he's getting ready to travel quite a bit. Um, last year he had a very, very good year as well, and this year looks very promising for Ricky T. So artists going um, um, overseas for, for the season. Also, Teddy and John as well will be doing some traveling. I want to get very quickly to the Calypso which uh, we started with talking about earlier and Pep has won it for the 8th time um, his equal Terra's record who's won it eighth for 8th eighth, eighth consecutive times Pep has won it for 8th he has won 8 crowns not consecutively but he's won 8 crowns um, and he's going for the ninth. he says next year he's going to be defending so quite a major achievement for uh, Pep I wanted to feature a little bit of we had a chat with him immediately after he won the crown and we heard a little bit about it he did a new song and he took a big risk because he was he was trailing in the semi-finals and he did a new song. It was a risk, but it worked for him very well. Now it must be said, unemployment down here is dread. And we need investment for our people to buy their bread. So when we object, we must do so with great respect. 
Let them know it's a mission heritage that we want to protect. Well, I tell you, it's been an elusive monarch for quite some time. I think it's 2009, so that's eight years now. I mean, I've worked, I've tried my best in, in the years past. I stayed away and then I've come back with, you know, mixed feelings. And it's wonderful to know that at least the eighth title is there. Um, I was looking at some point at the man Terra who has had the, 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 the most number of titles, which was eight titles. And I was hoping that one day I would be able to, to reach the heights of Terra. And although it's two different eras, but at least I think I've worked hard and I'm happy that it's, it has been able to come through this year. You took a big chance again like you did in 2009, <laughs> coming with a new song at the final. Yes, well, I mean, I had no choice, honestly, because after the quarterfinals and the, and the semifinals, when I looked at the scores that I was getting for the the people's, for what appeared to me to be the, to be the people's favorite song, the Louis Le Coco, it had been scoring very low in the in the last two um, competitions, and then I had, I had no, I mean, I said if I had to win, I had to change it, because I didn't see you know how I was going to, 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 to get. It was an almost a 90 point climb because in the, in the semi-finals I think I was almost 90 points behind the first place winner for the semi-finals and I think the only way I had to change it was to bring a new song and just hope that the song would work on the night and this is the third time it has worked. I think when I did the will way back in the 90s and then taking a chance tonight and of course um, that was in um, 2009 and now taking another chance again in 2017. It's crazy because you your season was a really short season, you just came to Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for... Solomon! Alright, so that was Pep. I uh, will speak, have a chat with Solomon just a little bit, but Pep um, obviously making history in St. Lucia and hoping to break the record that was set by Terra if he um, defends and he's promising to defend next year. So. Um, that's uh, an amazing historical moment in 2017 in terms of somebody calling a record that was set so many years ago, um, probably in the 60s when Terra uh, performed. Yeah. I'm just wondering, Bernard, what, whether, whether it says something for us as, as a society that um, that quality of Calypso coexists and we celebrate it um, mm -hmm. you know, very, very warmly. Um, it coexists with the with the with the sullies and the, the bad in bam bam and the spit in the middle, um, and perhaps it points to something that that I would love to see explored more is that this dichotomous, almost schizophrenic um, society that we have, the national psyche being capable of simultaneously of, of great um, nobility and, and and crassness almost at the same time, and I'm not labeling either one in that direction, but. We do seem to have this duality that 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 we can do both. Um, not sure what that says about us, um, but certainly it, it it should suggest that there's a lot of opportunity to channel channel that sort of energy into um, um, into great stuff that 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 travels, that is infectious, that is that is very very popular and has a certain universality about it. I mean, the reason why the Denry rhythm moves is because it is universal. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it is, whether you like it or not. It's, it has a universal, universal um, quality to it that, that would be good to tap into and find out what it is that works. Let's get a quick chat with Solange. We're going to wrap up in just a little bit. Uh, Solange was one of the revelations for 2017. She did it exceptionally well. Um, and like Pep was suggesting, that she could have won if he didn't change that song because she was the one who was leading him. Mm -hmm. And he said he had a 90-point gap, so that means that was quite... I suppose when he did, did his analysis, that was quite shocking to see that he had said the amount of ground he had to cover. So Lange was a revelation this year, along with Oshun, and I'm predicting that next year the ladies are going to rule, uh, because we have some pretty strong ladies. But let's get a little bit of Solange and we'll have a little shock chat. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for
Well, I still feel a winner. I think my message has resonated with quite a few people and um, it was a chance for us to celebrate together tonight um, uh, being St. Lucian. So I, I, I am a winner. Um, I respect the judge's decision, although you know you get the little stories here and there as to how people really feel, but I respect the judge's decision. I say thank you on behalf of my team and behalf of my family and my friends, on behalf of St. Lucians who really, really supported me and support the message that I brought into Calypso this year. So I congratulate the winner, the mighty Pep. Again, he brought in the theatrics and did what it took in order for him to ensure that he was the winner. So yes, he was the best man tonight, according to the judges. So I respect that, you know, in, in, in him and him, you know, knowing what to do to come and, you know, take it away. So um, maybe next year, um, interesting. Um, journey for the year for me but this is not the end of Solange even if I came first runner-up I intend to uh, do some philanthropic work and I intend to be a first runner-up of, of a difference uh, over the years you know once you've won Calypso you know you don't see or hear from the Calypsonians I intend to uh, be uh, a champion for engaging the young people as well as being engaged with our mature individuals in St. Lucia so look out for me I'll take this platform and use it uh, in a positive way and hopefully uh, the other Calypsonians who are around will rally with me and, you know, help change the face of Calypso beyond the Calypso season and carnival. The time has come in this station for us to end this division. Right here, right now, it's time to bridge the great divide. So already we can see the billing for next year, so large pep, <laughs> that's a big competition for next year, which is good for the art form as well. And we don't know if we'll have the kind of subject that we had for this year, unless I think there'll, there'll still be some spillovers, but that's so large. Hugh Black, um, obviously kind of self-destructed towards in his new verse, um, but uh, he did a, fairly that well. That was such a pity because it was sad, um, yes. um, I think he distinguished himself from very early as having some great content, yes. very topical. Um, on point and then he's such a great performer yeah. his delivery is excellent but I, I think that you're seeing um, you're seeing a, 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 a marked quality again let's talk about that a little bit a marked quality if you look at Pep you look at Solange mm -hmm. you look at um, um, Sully by Ricky T um, Arthur the, the, the top contenders are, are doing well in terms of quality and content mm -hmm. Uh, I would maintain an argument for really causing all ships to rise and paying a little bit more attention to the next to the next layer of containers so that you have what you described as a critical mass of of talent and you start to get an industry because we need more than one leader and a couple followers. Yes. We actually need a movement um, and and this is true of the of the of the costume and, and pageantry side of the of the carnival as well i must mention oshun who did exceptionally well this year yes. she didn't quite make it um, on the night but it was a good experience for her and i would as well to shout the east coast because the east coast was well represented she's from the east coast so to other denry guys and as you mentioned about development um adrian i agree with you in terms of now that we've seen what denry has to offer i think now the uh, well I, I hate to say the authorities but we have to basically agitate for music to be taught in all schools in Denry, especially songwriting. So the next generation of all, musicians, all schools. all schools generally, but I'm just yes. looking at Denry since they have this yeah. product and so on. All schools, all schools teach me yes. music writing because that's how you make some serious money. Yes, and then so you have a better quality. And it's of a writers. global industry. It's a global industry, and if you can draw on what what is us to project into the global marketplace, then you're already starting off with a distinct advantage. Um, and the, the, the whole Creole heritage and monetizing that, mm -hmm. the Creole rhythms and the Creole heritage together is, is a phenomenal resource. We need to, we need to use it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's our competitive advantage right there. Yeah. I wanted to feature very quickly before we leave, and I'll get you to comment on that now, but the old mass, I don't know if you saw the old mass. It's I part of, it's part of our carnival. Um, uh, the second day it was kind of messed up this, the, with, the with the rain and so on, but those of you who saw it on, on Monday got a full um, sense of what uh, the guys covered this year, so I have a little montage of the offering for 2017. That's the old mass. <laughs>
Do we have uh, a snapshot of the uh, All Mass for 2017? Obviously, it's one of the things we need to do. I mean, those are pretty good ones, but it's uh, something that we can get some some other guys writing as well. I mean, they can get so creative with it. But All Mass, All Mass has always been a, a favorite of the crowds over the years. It's always a favorite of mine. You can see the ingenuity of, of the imagination of some of our people, and um, it usually relates to what has been going on in the society and how people think about things. Um, but with our old mass, it, it seems to have become the usual suspects every year. Yeah. And we begin to expect the same faces all the time. What I think is that we should encourage a little more participation, maybe in the school's carnival or the kiddies carnival or the different district carnivals to have an old mass section where we can see some more creativity and and just bring out some more of our St. Lucianness. I think it adds a very interesting aspect to our carnival and I think it's something that should be should be encouraged where you could see more elaborate get ups, you know, maybe costumes or something of the sort. I don't know what's what's exactly how much the remuneration is for winning the old mass, but I think something should be done there to bring out the creativeness a little more. And it's something I think that the schools can get involved in a big way, especially the students who do literature and so on. There's so many things you can do with that. Creative, just put, now how you can conceptualize and put something on a, on a piece of ply, a piece of cardboard that's, you know, two by two or whatever it is. But there's potential there as well, and especially that can now translate into our carnival. So there can be another bigger section, because like you said, it's the usual suspects. We have to wrap up. I really appreciate, uh, gentlemen, you giving us the time. There's a lot more we could have covered the Queen show the steel man and so we didn't get around to that but it's something we'll cover on later on um, I want to thank you Adrian for giving us the time and also congratulate you on an amazing year as well thank you and Norbert uh, I'm sure you had a good time here I certainly did and we look forward to having you here again so hopefully next carnival I'm, I'm always here I'm, I'm not a St. Lucian missing in action <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> appreciate it I want to leave and Adrian just noted a while ago that the music that we use on the, the old mass as the band was from one of the costumes and it's one of the songs that I've been listening to quite a bit because I seem to like it and so I wanted to leave on that note with that piece of music and also the costume as well as to pay tribute to yeah and, and hats off to, to Sean Greaves for two very original very striking very creative portrayals in both his king and his queen. And, a, and an important statement about the, the state of the carnival. Most very definitely. Good. Show.